Every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com slash launch and launch your herd for life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. I would now like to introduce Dr. Eric Elkersma. Dr. Elkersma is founder and director of Strategic Analysis Services BV, a Dutch-based, globally active consulting firm in strategy, marketing and competitive intelligence, and training. Prior to establishing SAS BV, he worked for 20 years for Friesland Campina NV, one of the world's largest dairy companies. Dr. Elkersma has continued his education with several executive education degrees and certificates and has received multiple professional awards. He's also been a visiting lecturer, research fellow, and frequent speaker at conferences, schools, and institutes. Eric, the floor is now yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I'll share my screen as the slides will probably help you follow the story in a better way. But for those of you that are short of time, I have an extraordinary good news message. If you only want to spend one minute on this seminar because you've got very, other, uh, very important other urgent things to do, the great news is that the US dairy world, because I'm focusing on dairy today, is truly very well positioned for opportunities abroad and on the globe and probably the well the best positioned resource of dairy growth in the world and whether you can grasp that opportunity is all up to you and your choices but i believe the opportunity is there now fortunately this is a bell cam real science uh, lecture so i have to come with a solid substantiation for these statements if you don't have time for the substantiation, you've got a key message now. But I invite you to join me in the substantiation to get, say, feel for why I believe that countries you may not think about every day are actually driving global dairy demand and that retains a momentum that will keep dairy prices high. And the implication is so high that potentially for many of you in the US dairy value chain, that may be an attractive say, opportunity going forward. So what is the first thing we do? We look briefly at the aim of the work we did. Subsequently, we look at some results and we look at the dairy market's outlook that results from this. So insights on the future world market for dairy, and that's the export market from the major exporters to the major importers is what we look. When we say dairy importers, Many of us think China, and there's a good reason for it, as the statistics will go through show. However, there's more than China. So what we did in this analysis is also look at 12 other major dairy importing countries. And together, they make up about 80% of all the milk powder imports in 2021 globally. And then we're not talking imports between, say, from the US to the EU or from the EU to New Zealand. No, we're talking on imports from the major exporting blocks, being the EU, New Zealand, US, and a few other countries like Argentina and Uruguay, to those, say, belt of countries around the equator that are responsible for most of the imports of dairy products in liquid milk equivalents. So what insights are we looking for for these major importers? Things like price elasticity, we look at um, things like the uh, economic performance of these countries, a bit on demographics, and we definitely look at the import production and consumption balance for these countries. Let's first <clears throat> look briefly at this so-called world market for dairy and then demand and the supply side. At the le left side, in billion kilograms of energy controlled milk, if only to make it possible to add up all the different, say, um, factors with natural content per country, sometimes not being equal. So standardized measure, 
The net exporters, the countries I just mentioned, US is one of the leading ones together with the EU and New Zealand and a few others. They produce about 314 billion kilograms of milk. Most of it is still consumed domestically. So EU for EU or US for US. And available for exports in these countries is about 75 billion or 74 billion kilograms. We can't go to the, say, last digit. The real figure is slightly higher than this because this is only based on milk powders, cheese and butter. And there's a few other products like evaporated milk that cross borders, UHT milk that crosses borders. So the real figure is a bit bigger, but we're, we're focusing on skim, whole milk powder and, uh, and cheeses and butter, and butter uh, oil. And that <clears throat> if you assume, to keep it simple, that stocks do not increase or decrease, Structurally, you could say what is being exported is being imported. And there's no stock changes do not affect, say, the consumption. Also, in the importing countries, there's a, there are large volumes of products locally produced. And if you add up, say, this total box, it's about 520 billion kilograms. That's the dairy produced worldwide, processed in factories. There's a large volume of cow dairy not processed in factories, adding up to cow's milk over 800 billion kilograms, of which about 9 to 10% shifts from importers to exporters. And it's from exporters to importers. And it's exactly that volume that's in the focus today. And a little bit the local for local production. Here's the 12 major dairy importers and dark blue China. Because China is, comes to mind when, it talk, when you're talking dairy imports immediately. But places, as you probably, of course, are aware, in Mexi as Mexico, Algeria, Nigeria, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman. Here's uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam. There's, there's more countries. And we're, we're focusing on these 13 going forward. So what have we found? First of all, we want to discuss six beliefs with you. Beliefs that may, you may not have, but that I come across when talking about the dairy markets um, quite often. And one of those beliefs is dairy import volumes go down in net importing countries because these countries experience currency depreciation against the US dollar. So yes, in local currencies, they may spend more, but when you correct for the currency depreciation, they actually don't. You hear it often, especially in times of economic distress, when every sane individual in the world wants more dollars and less, say, exposed smaller currencies. So the US dollar goes up against, uh, say, emerging market currencies. And basically, the belief is that doesn't work for um, making those export markets attractive. Another belief that you come across is these are wonderful countries, but they're mainly home to low income consumers for whom buying dairy is a luxury. So the moment you're in, say, a situation where prices worldwide go up, consumers drop off out of the category and volumes get lost. And at the end of the day, attractiveness of those markets is limited because consumers simply can't afford it. A third belief is this high Population growth rate in the most of these countries sustains their poverty. Unfortunately, very bad news, but that doesn't make the market automatically attractive. Or a message like they remain economically weak versus the West. The rich got richer, but the poor remain poor. And yes, we've been talking about the bottom of the pyramid now for almost two decades, but the bottom of the pyramid still there, and it's still not an attractive marketplace. You talk to people, say, yeah, but... My friend, they're developing a local dairy farming sector. They're trying to work towards self-sufficiently. See, if I, we now invest for their markets, protectionism is on the rise. Are you sure that market will remain attractive? The, these people will pick up the capabilities to have efficient dairy farming themselves. And finally, at some stage, these markets, <clears throat> like our own, may well saturate. So by the time we've invested in the growth of these markets, 
they simply don't want to grow anymore because there's a limit in per capita consumption. And in some countries, that limit is much lower than in others. So you hear these beliefs. Now let's look at it. And remember, I tried to use a scientific approach. Let's look at some facts. I looked at the, to the currencies of these top 13 countries versus the US dollar for the period 2016 to 2021. And what do I find? If you take a weighted average based on the population of these individual countries, that actually at an index of 98, so in five years, they depreciated in average, weighted average for the major importing countries, they depreciated with 2%. Some actually even appreciated, like the Egyptian pound, or which was, of course, devaluated in 2016 and, and um, slightly bumped up again, or the Thai baht, or um, say the Malaysian ring, it was perfectly stable. No wonder, because it's packed against the US dollar, as is the currency in Oman, the currency in Saudi Arabia, the real, or the currency in the UAE. So the fact that China, with, of course, a very large population, had even a slight appreciation of their currency actually means that the whole story is more or less stable. And when you kick China out, it's 92. Still not dramatic. It's one and a half percent average depreciation rate, where if you compare it, for instance, with the UK, it was at 95. So how different is it from developed economies? Maybe we should revisit our considerations on the currency risk and, and be a bit more optimistic. Now let's look at population growth. The population growth for this 13 countries together, again, using uh, population as the basis for the weighted average, that's 1.0%. For the US and for the UK both, it was 0.7. So the difference was not so dramatic. Clearly, it was China that pulled, it, pulled the average down to some extent. You see some other countries with much higher uh, population growth. But if you kick out China, you go to 1.6, which is somewhere here. So yes, population growth in these countries have be, has been bigger, but especially major imported China, it's even lower. So it's I'm not saying it's entirely comparable, but it's certainly, it's not dramatic. These are no longer like, like say, Oman and Nigeria and the UAE, no longer growing so fast in the UAE. It's mainly due to, say, people moving there because the country uh, has a lot of immigration, as has Saudi. So population growth of, of, say, what we used to think of in these major dairy importing countries isn't so dramatically different anymore from the countries in the West. Now we look at economic growth. So what I did was I said, OK, what is the GDP per capita? So the gross domestic product per capita growth in purchasing power parity, because that's most, say, is the best measure for the spending power of consumers. And I looked for a 15 years period. And what do you see? I compared it with the UK, if only because the UK is typically, is especially now that it's um, independent from the EU, is a relatively large developed country. So it's, it's and it moreover, it's the cousins of the US. So it, it's easy for you to refer to. And what do you see in this period? Actually, the most of these countries outperformed the UK in GDP per capita growth, especially China. It went up from 17% of the UK's level to 39 in just a 15 years period. So the GDP per capita in, the, in China more than doubled compared to that in the UK in this particular period, more than doubled. Some countries like, like Saudi, and that is oil price related, there was a drop, and the same was true in the UAE, which is again is energy price related, where of course 2006 was very close to an energy price peak. Same for Oman. But if you look at the whole picture, Malaysia up, Indonesia with a large population up, Egypt up, Mexico stable, Nigeria stable, Philippines up, Thailand up, 
Vietnam up, China in particular up, and say a weighted average for population, it's actually up. So these economies have grown compared to a, say developed economy like the um, UK, and that growth continues. Now we move to the world raw milk pool, and we simply look at what happened in that world raw milk pool from 2010 to 2021. The big fur team, so th those are the uh, importing countries, saw their domestic production increase with 9 billion kilograms. But they added 16 billion kilograms of imports in, again, liquid milk equivalent energy controlled milk. So the majority of their consumption, 16 out of 25, more than 60%, was actually had its origin in imports. The, re the major exporters saw their milk pool increase with 33 billion kilograms and all others with 21. So if you, <clears throat> if you see what happened, the total pool was 80, the 50 billion kilograms in total in the um, big exporters were destined for one third to exports to overseas market and for one third for domestic consumption within these major exporters. And this was the volume in all other countries, uh, except India, Pakistan, for uh, obvious reasons, because those are relatively different dynamics and relatively isolated on a global scale. So for the sake of clarity, you see that the big importers had, have developed their dairy, local dairy industry, but have for one third, so for one in every three liters of milk in the major exporting countries of the growth of that pools, went to these 13 importing nations. Meaning there is growth in the big 13, but they need much more milk. And here's the evidence in another, presented in another way. Dairy self-sufficiency in the period 2010, 2021 has actually decreased if you take the weighted average by population. You see, it's clearly China that went down, where China had only 4% deficiency in 2010 developed into 26% de deficiency or 74% self-sufficiency in 2021. But you see most countries here, Algeria down, Egypt down, Indonesia up, Mexico down, uh, sorry, Indonesia down, of course, Malaysia stable, but extremely low, same in the Philippines, a little bit up in Oman, a little bit up in Saudi, Thailand stable, a little bit up in the UAE, more up uh, in Vietnam, but overall, these countries have become more deficient. So in spite of their dairy development programs, actually, they've become more, not less self-sufficient over a long period of time. We're not talking one or two years, so we're not looking at, say, um, a particular piece of noise. We're looking here at the trend line of the signal. So look, thinking of um, your famous cousin, Mr. Simon, uh, Winston Churchill, you, however beautiful the strategy of dairy development and self-sufficiency, you should occasionally look at the results. Dairy production in these major importing nations have not kept pace with dairy consumption. Production has not kept pace with consumption. These countries need more milk and they look at you in the US and at the EU and New Zealand, but mainly at you in the US to supply them going forward. Now you may wonder, can these people actually afford all this dairy? So what we did here is look at the percentage of GDP spent on dairy imports, taking say the commodity prices for cheese, butter, milk powder, etc., multiplying it with the imported volumes and then look what percentage of GDP have they spent on dairy imports? And what do we see? It's actually been more or less stable. So their economies have grown approximately at the same rate as the uh, dairy import in value. In other words, when these people get more money, they're willing to spend it on dairy. You've seen the economies at large grow, and you see that they keep on spending 
more or less the same percentage on dairy imports over time. Because the lines are almost equal, the weighted average, with, of course, China doubling. Some other countries may have dropped, like, like Nigeria slightly down, but generally most, and, and Egypt down. But overall, purchasing power has been sufficient across the board to keep on buying dairy at the same rate as that economic growth developed. And they have, these markets are certainly not yet saturated. Here we're looking at the um, per capita consumption in liquid milk equivalent in 2010 compared to 2021. And it's gone up with a compound annual growth rate of more than 2%. This is per capita. This is already corrected for their population growth. So as you see here, the weighted average was here around 20%. And it's gone up to almost 30%. 30 uh, kilograms, sorry, 20 kilograms per capita to 30 kilograms per capita. And as you see across, with the exception of Oman, Nigeria being more or less stable, slide down, most countries are up. And this is per capita consumption. Of course, you're telling me the US is at the 300 kilograms per capita uh, consumption. Sure, these countries are not where you are, but these countries do grow and the population of Indonesia and Egypt together is bigger than that of the US. But here's, here's a clear, strong growth. This is 10% uh, up per capita. And on top, there's a, there's a population growth. So what do we see? These importer markets have actually proven to be relatively strong. And maybe we should revisit the belief myths that we, um, that we discussed because these countries have not really experienced currency depreciation. Even if you take China out, that currency depreciation is 1.5% per year at best. They've developed a thriving middle class for whom buying dairy has become a staple because the, the, uh, they keep buying and, and their purchasing power is sufficient to keep buying. So when there's an economic hiccup, they don't jump out of the category anymore. They have a population growth rate, but it's becoming more moderate. Hence, the old thinking, many people, low buying power, may no longer apply to the major dairy importers. They may still apply to some countries, but these countries already are no longer importing dairy because they can't afford it, because these middle income countries can. They have an economically, uh, they have economically grown much faster than the West, as we've seen. We saw the comparison with uh, the UK, where China, for instance, has grown in an in an eleven year period twice more than to say twice as fast as uh, as the UK. And we had they have a developing local dairy farm sector, yes, but self sufficiency is down. So what you, and they need to show dairy market situation either with especially cheese imports growing fast. So the attractiveness, if you look from a business school perspective, what about attractiveness of the market? These are all signals that these markets may structurally become more attractive than they already are. So let's look then at uh, how these countries developed. So let's look at total dairy volume, population growth and per capita growth, protein and fat component imports, say the two dairy components, volume and mixed growth, import value per capita, etc. So here's <clears throat> the first picture is for these 13 countries. You see that their consumption increased with over six kilograms per capita over from 2010 to 2021. China increased with 6.2 kilogram per capita and the others increased with 6.6 .6 kilogram per capita. And this is <clears throat> the, uh, um, sorry, this diagram should, doesn't matter. So what you see, this is the local raw milk pool they developed, and this is the imports from uh, the major exporters, same here, where in China, the growth has mainly been due to the major importers, the major exporters in, uh, sending their exports to China where here the balance is slightly more balanced. But you see, it's not just China. We always think, yeah, it's all because of China. No, it is because also Indonesia, 
was also say the countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, etc., were also at least as much a per capita as in China. And this delta is actually their increase of consumption, partly locally made, but mainly imported. Now, per capita growth actually determines 80% of the volume growth. So when you make the, the split, what happened due to volume growth and what happened due to uh, population, sorry, due per capita growth and what happened due to population growth, population growth is only 18% responsible for the growth. It is 82% in China is per capita growth. So you don't need to worry so much about saturation because per capita growth is still up. It's not just population growth. If you take the global picture, it's 50-50. If you take this picture, it's actually 80-20. It's mainly people wanting to consume more of a wonderful dairy, but to a large extent is produced in the US for their uh, nutritional needs, for their nutrition for vitality. So if you take <clears throat> an overall picture and you simply calculate the amount of protein within skim milk powder, protein within whole milk powder, and protein within cheese. And of course, you, you, you have to make some assumptions because you can't take any cheese type and then calculate all the details. And it's not probably also not necessary for the conclusion you draw here. You simply see that for these top 13 countries, an annual compound annual growth rate of 6% in volume in protein imports can be calculated. And you can argue whether that 6% is always stable. You see some years fluctuate more than others, but overall it's 6%. So you have a 6% volume growth rate. Now, if you go to Wall Street and you look for investments, if you find a company that delivers 6% volume growth rate, you're pretty happy because most have difficulty reaching that. Now look at <clears throat> the differences between countries, and they are relevant. And here you see that there is a reason that you think of China first, because with China included, we're talking 6%. Taking China out, we're talking at almost 4%. So yes, there is a reason that China, with 12% uh, volume growth, compound annual growth rate over this more than a decade period that we all think of China. But there are quite a few other countries with in total approximately the same population that have also delivered 4% volume growth rate. And that may have even more potential for the future because here's the population growth is zero, but here or 0.5, but here it's 1.5. So in other words, yes, China has been very important and probably will be in the near future, but there's more countries and we shouldn't just focus on China and all the, say, geopolitical trade balance uh, questions that China and the US have and China and the EU to a lesser extent. But there's more. There's not just China. Now, here we look at the total dairy fat, which is embedded in whole milk powder or in cheese or simply butter and butter oil. Again, Believe it or not, it's almost identical to the protein amount that was imported. This is 6.2%. And this is a remarkable coincidence because, of course, technically, butter and uh, milk powder, skim milk powder in particular, are completely separate markets. But if you add it up, you see that the total, say, compound annual growth rate is similar. It's both 6% of all fats and all proteins leaving the major exporters to find their homes in the major importing nations. And here's an interesting fact. Here you see that the other 12 is considerably lower than the one with China. China has again been the by far leading importer of dairy fats in the compound annual growth rate. But here you see Egypt and Nigeria actually being negative. How to interpret those data? Essentially, my temporary um, or tentative conclusion here is that these countries have consumers that can increasingly difficulty afford dairy fat. 
So because the pool from a say higher income country compared to Nigeria and Egypt called China, China's pulling so hard at their effect that consumers in this country, for economic reasons, leave the dairy fat category, they stay with protein as long as they can, because protein substitution, dairy protein substitution for, with other nutrition is pretty complicated, but dairy fat substitution by vegetable oils and, and fats is more easy. And there's many dairy concepts, say, produced with dairy protein and vegetable fat. So because China pulls so hard, it's countries like Egypt and Nigeria that actually drop out of the category. That means if you take the ratio of imports of the total world market imports by dairy commodity, it's for these countries, it's actually the leading countries that consume ever more, that take in ever more for skim. They moved up from 75 to 77 percent for whole milk powder from 61 to 73 from butter and butter oil to from 35 to 65. why am i showing you this only to make my point in another way that the mid-income countries are actually forgive me the term starving the low-income countries from access to dairy products because if it's the mid-income countries that can basically outspend the low-income countries, especially on the fat side, but also to, to a lesser extent on the protein side, that means that it's only the mid-income countries that in the future can still afford dairy. And the, the, the belt of countries around the equator, the 13 that we're, look, we're looking at, are mid-income countries almost without exception. And Nigeria may be on the lower side per capita income uh, of that bunch of countries. And you see Nigeria actually losing fat compared to, uh, to the, the likes of China and, um, and Malaysia. So what I'm trying to say is we got a free tire world. We got a world with about 4 billion consumers that probably can hardly afford imported dairy. We've got 3 billion consumers living in these importing nations, and we've got 1 billion consumers living in the exporting nations. And the exporting nations <clears throat> see their raw milk price go up. The importers, the 3 billion people living in these mid-income uh, importing nations are basically like a, like a vacuum cleaner absorbing the volume sold by the exporters at an ever higher price. And it's the 4 billion consumers say in the low income countries that can't afford dairy or are completely depending on local dairy as in India and Pakistan, which is already 1.6 of that 4 billion people. So another, another way of looking at it is that the top 13 in volume absorb 94% of all export volume growth by the major dairy exporters. Another way of looking, it's, it's say half of the importing nations population, the top 13, but they take in 94%. It's the low income countries, quite a few in Africa, that basically can't afford dairy anymore. And certainly not say grab the growth. So dairy, whether we like it or not, due to all kinds of policies, which I don't want to discuss, but think about the environmental constraints that are coming up in places like Europe and New Zealand for, for expanding in dairy production, if not to say reversing the size of the dairy production, are leading to a world where dairy increasingly becomes a luxury and the number of consumers pulling at that dairy is likely to be larger than the number of, uh, say, uh, th than the volume growth to keep prices stable. So the top four, 13's absolute growth in US dollar, if you, if you want to add a monetary figure, is up 8 billion, again, a CAGR of more than 6%. So this is the import value growth in million US dollars. So 4.8 billion, so to say. And this is the value growth of the um, other countries. And here's the other 12. So this is the um the gross the total picture this was what the importers what in 2010 was imported by china 
This is the growth. So China almost quadrupled. This was already imported by the other 12, and he's 50% growth on top as well. Total being, some of these two being 8 billion up, being 6.6% compound annual growth rate. If you then <clears throat> look at the horizontal axis, say um, the years, and at the vertical axis, the dairy import value per kilogram liquid milk equivalent for this top 13 countries, and I expressed it in constant US dollars per kilogram LME. Of course, you see the massive peak for 2020, uh, for 2013, which you may all remember. And here's the average for these this year period, just above 40 cents. This is not the same as a milk price. This is the milk price plus the processor's conversion cost and margin if applicable. And you show, you see it's cyclical. You've all experienced it and hopefully you survived the worst things of that volatility. And you also know that of course in 2022, it was sharp up, but this is what happened. And we use this to come to an outlook. And <clears throat> We did it by looking at economic growth because we saw that correlation earlier. And what do we find if you take the weighted average of these countries' import value compound annual growth rate over the GDP growth compound annual growth rate, you find the average is 1.1. In layman's term, if the economy grows with 1%, so does the value growth of dairy imports. They held hands more or less, or 1.1. 1, 1 .1. I mean, don't look at the last digit behind, to, behind the dot. In other words, economic growth equates to dairy imported value growth. What does that mean? If indeed we can use the assumption that the top 13, I'm not talking the total dairy market, I'm just talking these major importers, equate to 1.1 times the GDP growth in real dollars, this is before inflation, then if we have an outlook like the one, for instance, that IMF produces, this is the January 23 edition, if we have this outlook and we use this multiplication factor, we can assess the trend line in constant US dollars for the future dairy import value growth when we assume that what we found in history being a ratio of 1.1 is indeed applicable for the future. So what does that look like? It basically looks like this, ladies and gents. We see this line, which is the dairy import value for China and the other 12 together in constant US dollars. You can basically see this is the outlook when you take the IMF's data and multiply the economic growth weighted for these countries times 1.1, and believe it or not, the line simply continues. Of course, we all know that in 2022, we may have been above that line. So I'm not telling you that the noise of the signal will go out, but I'm telling you that the upward trend likely will continue. In a world where dairy production growth, especially in Europe and New Zealand, which should cater for say these import uh, value will not be there. So if there is no growth in volume, for instance, say that the LME volume available for export is stable, which is the, the, say put one of the potential scenarios I developed or may even go down, you may develop different pictures for what the value growth will be. And I, I in the interest of time, I skip the details and immediately move on to the picture. This is still in constant, so before inflation, US dollars. And if you just assume that because the global growth of the dairy pool is not significant anymore, then this is the trend line you expect for the so-called dairy import value that is milk price plus processor conversion cost plus processor margin. And it's steep up, ladies and gents, much higher than we've seen. This is, and please, please, I want to repeat it. I want to put emphasis on this. This is before inflation because the less volume these importing nations buy, the more they can afford to pay per unit. 
And that's exactly how it works. And that's exactly how it makes sense to believe it will continue to work. I'm not in the prediction world. I'm just working out a scenario. This is what they can spend. If they can spend less, they'll go for a bargain. But if they need to, and the fight for, for say, dairy nutrition worldwide is on between different consumers, this is what they potentially probably can spend. And if you correct it for inflation, we're looking at somewhere like 75 US dollar cents, including processing uh, cost and margin. Possibly by 2027. And the, the good news is when you look at the 2022 figure, where the exports, for instance, from the US to the world market were in liquid milk equivalents, more or less stable. And then you see that would be equate to about 53 US dollar cent for this dairy import value. Well, actually, it was exactly 50. It was 52, the actual. I just found the actual because it, the, the dairy export data for 2022 have just been released uh, for the US. And it was actually 52. So, so far, the model seems to suggest that this could well be a future line after inflation using the IMF data for inflation. So this is in real US dollars, the sort of dollars you uh, get on your bank account and spend for your new house or car or whatever. So what it means is the less milk that globally will be available, the higher the prices probably will be because that's what the countries can afford. I'm not saying you're going to spend. It's not the same as what the price will be, but it's at least what they can afford. And it could well be if you take a global growth of the raw milk pool of about zero, which is which is in another study proved to be a reasonable estimate for the processed milk volume worldwide, that could be around zero, which has to do with, with say, droughts and climate change related uh, effects, environmental constraints, uh, farmer demography, the many factors, then it could well be that by 2027, we get used to, uh, say, world raw milk price of 70 cents. This is raw milk price. So what do we see? We see the outlook of scarcity and prolonged high prices, a battle for milk between consumers, which is global. Yes, the dairy market globally will remain cyclical. There's always noise on the signal trend. The trend line, however, remains sharply up. So key driver for the trend is strengthening demand, strong economic growth and some population growth in mid-income, top 13 is mid-income dairy importing nations. And the number two is constrained glo uh, global supply, environmental constraints, farmer demography, slow dairy development in major countries, for instance, due to water scarcity, etc. So the battle for milk is out there. Implications being in layman's terms, we probably will face a global scarcity for cows, milk and resulting dairy products. Dairy commodity and milk price grow, milk prices grow on a trend line faster than inflation. Dairy will increasingly become unaffordable to ever more global low income consumers. So it's a mid income consumer product also outside, say what we consider the developed world economically. And with the EU and New Zealand as export, be, exporters being restrained, I think there's a huge opportunity for the US to export more dairy. So I think the future is especially of this market opportunity, is yours. And I thank you for your time and interest. Thank you, Dr. Elgersma. Uh, but before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer all the questions that have been submitted during today's presentation. Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow, every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. 
As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of the screen. Uh, Eric, our first question is, when demand from these major importing countries is strong, why do you see dairy commodity prices coming down so sharply right now? Ooh, Kim, a uh, key, key point remains that there's a difference between a signal and a noise. And what we're talking about here is a signal which we believe to be consistently up, faster than inflation in terms of prices, but that doesn't mean there won't be any volatility in the dairy markets. There will be times that supply exceeds demand growth. And in those periods, prices will simply say uh, be lower, lower or lowering up to the moment that uh, say supply growth again becomes lower than demand growth. And that will set prices accelerating again. So the volatility in the dairy markets is not there, is not out, but the trend line is up. And I think we should watch the trend line for major investments, but you should watch, um, say, your liquidity uh, in times of volatility. And the volatility will be with you for now and years to come. And thinking of that volatility, Scott is asking, why is butter taking such a leap in total world market imports in recent years? That is probably due to, uh, especially due to China, where in China, the appreciation for real dairy is increasing. In other words, if you, butter is a component in processed cheese, which is picking up in China. Butter is a component in food service, in a westernization of diets, in ice cream. And you, if you can do with the real thing, why have vegetable oils? So the appreciation for the taste and the real thing is increasing worldwide and not just in China. You can't I still, I mean, in the perception of many consumers, you can't compromise uh, on the, the taste of the real thing. And why would you if you can afford it? And that kind of leads us to our next question. Tim is asking, what do you see as the next big driver of dairy consumption in these importing countries? Six letters starts with a C, cheese. And that has to do with the cultural, um, I'm not saying globalization, but the cultural interest in what we know to be convenient foods. And cheese is often a component, whether it's the Italian kitchen where cheese features in the, in the pizza, or where cheese or on the pizza, where cheese fe features in your pastas, whether it's the more hamburger culture where cheese features on a cheeseburger. These products increasingly become a worldwide, uh, say, easy dining, uh, casual dining sort of happening for many, many consumers, very aspirational. And cheese exports grow faster than almost anything else in dairy. So I think cheese is the, is the key word. Um, what about the loss of dairy demand in Western countries to plant-based products? How would that affect the picture you've sketched out? I think we we definitely need to be aware that plant-based will be there and will be growing. However, those consumers that care about nutrition know that there's only few plant-based concepts that even come close to dairy per unit of nutrition. And those legislators, and I hope you'll educate them, try to educate them just as well as we try here in Europe, those legislators that care about nutrition for the, the population and their constituents should not focus on, say, things like CO2 footprint per unit of milk or per unit of volume, but CO2 footprint per unit of nutrition. And the moment you do it per unit of nutrition, critical for human needs, you come to very different comparisons. And suddenly there, there's only a few, say, non-dairy products that can match uh, the nutritional quality of dairy. So I don't see dairy being excluded from nutritional recommendations anytime soon, because if you, if, if you all move over to soy or, or even worse, almond uh, sort of products, your nutritional quality of your intake may deteriorate. And there may be, uh, and moreover, you're probably spending more money. So I don't see the relevance of losing consumers to plant-based, especially when you look at nutritional profiles as uh, or, or the, the speed of 
losing consumers as so dramatically. And on top, I don't see very, say, convincing quality cheeses made out of 100% plant-based raw materials. So on the one hand, I think on a nutritional level, uh, the plant-based alternatives cannot compete with drinking milk, yogurts, etc., with a few exceptions, because I don't want to make this too general a statement. And secondly, in cheese, technology has not developed uh, enough to make acceptable, from a taste and structure perspective, cheese is 100% vegetable product-based, or at least they haven't reached the market yet. And before they've taken over, we're definitely beyond 2030, I would say. Um, as a follow-up, Jeff is asking, is the plant-based phenomena as popular in other countries as it is seems to be in the U.S.? It's more Anglo-Saxon than uh, you may realize indeed. You see it in the U.S., you see it in places like uh, the U.K. It is relevant in the con on the continent in some countries, but I'd like to emphasize it's always been there in places like Indonesia and, and Vietnam and Thailand. And these are dairy growth countries. So soy milk was the staple and cow's milk was actually the premium in these markets. And their dairy is actually growing at the cost of plant-based or at least at the same rate of plant-based. So don't over, overestimate the relevance of the picture you see next door in your supermarket for the global picture. There's so many people aspiring to have dairy and, and um, quite a few of them, low income consumers that are actually can't afford dairy anymore. So I, I, I think the demand is there. It's only a question, how much can we meet with uh, the current supply at, at what price? Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, next question is, rising demand does not automatically automatically equal business opportunity. What does the U.S. dairy farmer need to believe to see this rising demand as a growth opportunity? That's true. That's a, that's a very true statement. Um, I would say, what do you need to believe as U.S. dairy farmer? You need to believe that your government cares about feeding the world in the right balance with uh, saving the planet's climate. And if that balance is chosen, that you can't feed, that's no point not feeding the world and saving the climate, neither is a point to waste the climate and feed the world. So you, if your government fight, finds the right balance and understands the value of dairy as a source of nutrition for humans going forward, and dairy actually being a an, an climate-friendly, uh, say, approach, especially when you use the, the high and uh, sophisticated technologies available in the U.S. for producing dairy. If your government understands it and, and takes a regulatory approach, regulatory approach that, that um, resonates that understanding, you're very well positioned. Excellent. Um, next question is, Michelle's asking, we talked a lot about China today, but then you ended with the 2027 20, outlook. Will China still be the major player in 2027? What other countries will take a lead in five or even 10 years? China will definitely remain important. I don't see, as a, as a, as a major dairy importer, I don't see the China, uh, China domestic dairy development keeping up with China's domestic dairy demand, in particularly not when uh, in Chinese, in the Chinese, say, uh, city consumption, the Western diet for casual dining, etc., continues to grow at the rate that it's growing and that and the implications that has for cheese consumption, because, as you know, every kilogram of cheese is nine liters of milk. So I definitely count on China growing. I don't see their local dairy development keeping up. However, places like Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, they continue flying up. And, and they've been doing that for 20 years, and I see no reason whatsoever for that growth to, to slow down, especially when the climate and geology, say, soil conditions, etc., of these countries for having large dairy herds are not fantastic, to say the least. So they want dairy. 
and they, they definitely see their countries are not particularly suited for dairy farming. So they look for imports and they can afford those. Brad is asking um, if you could give us one key thing to watch for in the next 12 months, what would that be for dairy imports? Ooh. Uh, I would say if you want to convince yourself that dairy imports, say from major importers and, and say exports from places like the US, look at the cheese exports per month that are say reported by your government. And you see cheese to third markets, in your case, that's an EU term, cheese to whatever other market, you'll probably see that increase again, as it did last year with, with approximately 10% in volume. And those volume increases, then think about the price increase that comes on top. I think should be evidence that your position in the world market is on the up. And uh, it has more potential for growth. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that um, is all the questions that we have for today. So um, thank you, Dr. Elkersma, and thank you everyone for joining us at today's webinar. Now, if you do have additional questions or something comes up, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues March 7th with Dr. Joe McFadden from Cornell University as he presents Mitigating Enteric Methane Emissions and How Can We Speed Up progress. So that fits right in with your comments today. And on April 4th, Avine Van Rimstick from NEDAP Livestock Management joins us to share cow monitoring technology, revealing her secrets to unlock her true potential. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register for all future webinars. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for Real Science Exchange or visit balchem.com slash podcast. If you want a cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll get that off to you. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Elkersma, thank you for joining us today. <laughs>